Thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. Welcome to the CAMEX and ACE Industry Awards, the expanded edition. My name is John Bussell, VP of the Composites Growth Initiative at ACMA, and I'll be the host for this webinar. You know, in this pandemic year, this webinar was created to introduce you to the winners of these prestigious industry awards and provide a forum for the winners to provide insight and education to those new composites innovations. Normally, at an in-person CAMEX, a special display is located on the exhibit floor with dedicated times for the submitters to meet with attendees and answer questions and give a little bit more of those insights. This virtual event is intended to mimic that experience. We hope that you find the value in this format. So I want to acknowledge Composite One for great, gratefully being a sponsor of all the CAMEX and ACE awards. So let me get started uh, with our program. The CAMEX award recognizes the cutting edge innovations and innovators that are shaping the future of composites and advanced materials in the marketplace. This award celebrates visionary concepts and products that show strength through collaboration while bringing low cost materials, high volume applications with high performance applications and low volume materials. CAMEX is looking for innovations that have the potential to increase manufacturing efficiency, significantly impact new and emerging markets, shift industry expectations, impact sustainability and recyclability, utilize the power of collaboration, and shape the future of manufacturing. So for our segments today, uh, each of our presenters will be uh, giving a short 10-minute uh, overview of their presentations, and we'll have uh, one to two minutes for questions. Everyone is on mute. We encourage you to uh, provide your questions in the Q&A uh, box at the bottom of your screen. So if you take your, your mouse and you scroll to the bottom, you'll see a toolbar that shows up and you'll see the Q&A uh, icon. Click on that and submit your questions. So with that, our first CAMEX award winner for combined strength addresses a number of challenges and demands in manufacturing today. The demand for increasing component performance, the demand for multi-material design applications, the need for reduced processing steps, and the demand for precision. Our first presenter will be Jim Nelson with 3M Company. Jim is the technical lead for 3M's Advanced Residence Program where he has been for 23 years developing nano-modified materials and product development and advanced resins for composites. The award winner in this category for combined strength is lightweight, lower cost COPVs for hydrogen FCEVs providing extended vehicle range through the use of 3M matrix resins. With that, the podium's over to you, Jim. Thanks, John. <clears throat> so I'm here to tell you uh, uh, and describe our concept around using advanced resin design and advanced composite design to deliver a differentiated product that meets a number of market needs. Uh, OEMs are, are, uh, are fixated in this market on getting the cost out of these very important tanks for fuel cell vehicles. Uh, the actual storage system for fuel cell vehicles makes up 35% of the vehicle cost. And when you actually look at the tanks, 90% of the cost for a tank is based around the expense of the carbon fiber. So we feel our value proposition is well aligned to reduce the cost facing these OEMs. Basically what the concept is, is through the use of an advanced resin technology, you can greatly thin the walls of a hydrogen tank which is a high pressure unit and deliver different design concepts. So usually you think about uh, reducing wall thickness and keeping the liner the same dimensions. This leads to a, an opportunity to remove 21% of the weight. Most of that is carbon fiber. 
Uh, there's no change in the volume or gas carrying capacity of the unit. And you can take 15% of the cost out because you're greatly reducing the amount of carbon you're using. The other option, since the outer diameter of these tanks is usually constrained in their application, you can expand the liner. And this now gives you an opportunity to save weight, cost, and also increase the volume and thus the range. And this reduces a lot of the range anxiety that people have around the use of fuel cell vehicles. How do we do this? We're approaching the, the, uh, the resin component of this by putting um, uh, large quantities of nanoparticles into the resin. As you can see from the SEM, the little white dots that surround the carbon toes there are the nanotechnology. And we feel this is the only way to add fillers to advanced resins without filtration. Uh, bigger particles and anything with a large aspect ratio will not, uh, will not uh, get down between the toes. And we do this while maintaining the application of the resin within the composite process you're using. So there's a lot of formulation work that goes on here to make this happen. What's unique about the technology is that we see a simultaneous improvement in both modulus and toughness. These properties are usually at odds, and that's what usually makes this uh, resin technology quite interesting. Uh, it starts by looking at the performance of these resins in different um, uh, tanks. And so we've done some studies where we've looked at putting the, the resin into a, a, a traditional uh, COPV and looked at uh, what happens when you try to burst these vessels. And as you can see, you get a nice improvement in the hydro burst result, um, which translates to an improvement in fiber delivered strength. Uh, and that is described by this percent translation increase when you compare that to the lot uh, fiber strength listed on the C of A. So we see a nice improvement of fiber delivered strength. Well, what does this mean for tank design? Uh, and what's going on? What's going on on the fiber, right? So what we feel is happening, we've looked at this from single toe tensile testing. And what happens is we shift the entire distribution of the, the strength distribution on T700, for example, by using the fiber. And what we've schematically shown here is that we, we are basically using a high modulus resin to support the fibers. And when the fibers start to break, there's more support given by the high modulus resin. And that's what's allowing you to get more fiber delivered strength out of your fiber. It's more efficiently using the fiber delivered strength and it's improving load transfer. So what we typically do is start with the resin. We do some small scale tank development as shown on the left. We get a nice improvement of fiber delivered strength. And then we go into the design portion of this where we ask the question, what can we do on a, in terms of removing weight and increasing volume, if we were to look at a, a tank that uh, is uh, set to burst at about 25,000 uh, PSI uh, with some known parameters. So out of this comes the result that you can, as shown in the table, change the internal volume, you can uh, improve the, uh, the, the actual efficiency of the design by increasing the volume and lowering the weight, taking, taking um, very expensive fiber out of the structure. So this is the results of this in more detail. You see that the vented internal volume can increase. You're taking the, the weight down and you're, this basically improves the efficiency. While you're doing this, you're making a lighter weight tank that is manufacturing faster. It's manufactured faster, I should say. It costs less because you're removing fiber and you're increasing the gas volume, which actually improves range. Again, just to show this again, the end result is that you have design options that can improve weight, volume, and cost, and you're making these tanks much quicker because you're only putting half the amount of uh, resin and fiber onto the actual mandrel while you're filament winding these structures. That basically summarizes what we're trying to do. We're trying to produce a differentiated tank design through the use of advanced resins. And this work was done in collaboration with Hypercomp out of, out of the Utah area. Uh, they're expert uh, tank designers and, and uh, quite thrilling to work with. So I'll thank you for the opportunity to go through this, uh, this presentation and thank you very much for uh, the award. Thank you very much, Jim. Uh, and congratulations on winning the Combined Strength Award. Uh, it's a very, uh, uh, novel concept, and I'm sure this didn't happen over time. Uh, we do have a couple of questions that have uh, come in, uh, so I'd like to address a couple of those. 
Um, one was, uh, can you talk about the fatigue uh, characteristics of this particular resin on the application for uh, these tanks? Sure. So um, we've done fatigue on flat laminates. We've done fatigue in uh, CNG vessels. Um, and we are in the process of looking at hydrogen vessel fatigue. I can say from our CNG work that we saw a 75% improvement in fatigue life uh, in that structure. And we're expecting uh, larger increases for the hydrogen because of the thickness of the walls. We feel that the particles will have a bigger role in hydrogen, but we should have that data by the end of the year. Great. Uh, second question I have for you is, uh, did you do any research into the cryogenic liquid hydrogen storage or hydrogen permeability? Uh, we've not looked at cryogenic. Uh, we have a collaboration with HyberComp to look at that, um, and that's in progress. Um, we've not done any work looking at, at permeability to date. Okay, another question that's come in. Does carbon fiber have good affinity to the resin? Uh, resin I'm sorry. And what is the percent void? Um, so tanks, I, my understanding of tanks is that they traditionally have one to three percent voidiness. Um, and that was certainly the case when we were manufacturing uh, CNG vessels back in the day. Um, the resin has a, a really good affinity uh, for the, the fiber. There's, there's some types of fiber that, that contain what I would call loose siding, uh, sizing, sizing that's not uh, attached to the fiber. That can create some issues um, because these, these composites have far less resin. But in general, with most fibers, we see very good um, adhesion to fiber, uh, and we've actually developed some other techniques to improve that adhesion that uh, we could talk about under the right conditions. And uh, last question, because I'm curious, because of the more efficient use of the resin, are you seeing a more cost-effective solution as compared to what would normally be seen in this marketplace? Yeah, we've, we've spent um, probably the last eight years trying to uh, develop nanotechnologies that can be applied um, that don't take resin prices from $3 a pound out to $60 a pound. So we have very cost competitive resin um, solutions now that we feel uh, can displace carbon fiber and save cu uh, customers money. So in your design of your tank and in the process that you're, you're making them by. Okay, and I'm gonna sneak this one question in, uh, but this has gotta be the last one. How do you control nanoparticles in compounding to avoid HSE issues? So we're not selling free nanoparticles. Um, we are selling uh, a resin that has nanoparticles dispersed in it and totally encapsulated by resin. When you cut a composite made by these materials, you're not breathing nanoparticles. We've done those studies. Uh, you're, you're basically seeing a traditional resin. We buy resin from every company that sells resin and we modify it so that the, um, the nanoparticles are dispersed. The dispersion process is quite finicky and it's really that that technology is our, our bread and butter that we've spent 30 years developing. So we, we like to give the solution as a formulated resin or as a master batch that people can let down, but we're not selling free nano. Well, thank you very much for answering the questions in your presentation. And again, congratulations on behalf of Camex and Composites One for winning the Combined Strength Award and hopefully we'll see uh, 3M in future competitions. But thank you very much. Thank you. So I'd like to uh, continue on with our next presentation. The second CAMEX award is for unsurpassed innovation, and it is presented to the composites product that clearly demonstrates a novel design that incorporates low cost materials for high volume applications or with high performance applications with low volume materials, which delivers a product that is innovative and has the potential to either significantly impact existing or open new markets. Mighting Buildings is based in Oakland, California as a construction technology company, creating beautiful, affordable and sustainable homes using 3D printing 
and robotic automation. Our presenters today will be Sam Rubin. Sam is Chief Sustainability Officer and co-founder at Mighty Buildings. His passion and deep understanding of sustainability and compliance drew him to the vision of addressing the housing affordability crisis. And also joining him will be Alexei Dubov. Alexei is Chief Operating Officer and co-founder at Mighty Buildings. Alexei holds more than 10 patents for his previous inventions and has been universally recognized for the field of operations and team growth for complex technologies. The product that is one is called Manufactured Polymeric-Based UV Cured Structures for Residential Construction. The podium is all yours, Sam and Alexi. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, John. So as John mentioned, uh, we're Sam and Alexei from Mighty Buildings, and we're based here in Oakland, California. And so just to tell you a little bit about us. Uh, so we were found, originally founded in August 2017 and re recently launched out stealth mode after three years of deep focus on our certification and our, our research and development. And we've actually already started delivering some accessory dwelling units, uh, backyard apartments here in California using our technology. So we're a venture-backed startup uh, backed by such VCs as Coastal Ventures, Y Combinator, and others. And we're currently operating out of a 79,000 square foot facility here in Oakland, California that used to be a uh, coffee warehouse, which really highlights the ability of our, our production system to establish uh, presence in existing warehouse space rather than needing uh, custom built buildings. And we currently have an IP portfolio of over 15 patents and 11 trademarks and designs. Um, and if we go to the next slide and we'll show you a little bit about what our tech big breakthrough is. So this was back uh, pretty early in our existence, uh, early, early 2018, when we were still working on a tabletop printer. But what this video highlights is the key breakthrough and the key technology that we've developed that really opens up the possibilities in construction. So the really cool thing about our material that you can see from this video is that we're actually able to print unsupported spans as well as printing multiple layers with full chemical cohesion. And this is because we've created a unique uh, type of thermoset composite that leverages UV light to cure, which means that it cures quickly enough that it hardens so you get that initial uh, weight support, but that you still get that chemical cohesion as the additional layers are added. So this allows us to create full volumetric modules, uh, pa wall panels, various components for buildings in order to really unlock productivity in the sector and maximize the value of the labor. So this is an example of the fully printed prototype we did of one of our Mighty Studios, which is a small 350 square foot backyard uh, apartment studio designed to fit in 80% of all California backyards. And so as you can see with our material, we're able to print the interior and exterior of the wall as well as an infill pattern that we then leverage industrial robotic arms to pour foam insulation into in order to achieve our values well exceeding California's requirements. Uh, meaning we can not only meet California's zero net energy standards, we can also move past that into certifications such as Passive House and others that really highlight the energy efficiency of what we're doing. And we've also been doing a lot of work on the regulatory side because this is really a really unique product to be bringing into the construction in industry, even more so than 3D printed concrete. And so we've been working closely with UL because along with their over 100 years of experience in building life safety, they also have some of the world's leading experts in ad manufacturing. So as a result of the work with them, which resulted in them breaking down some internal silos and having seven different departments working together, they actually created a new standard, UL 3401, for the use of 3D printing in construction, which is based on our evaluation report. And that's been added to the 2021 International Residential Code as an adoptable appendix to provide guidance to municipalities and jurisdictions, even countries that wanna bring 3D printing into their building code directly. So this really opens up new opportunities for global deployment. And we've also been approaching 3D printing from the prefabricated uh, building space rather than doing on-site. This gives us some key advantages uh, as we are the first and so far only company certified under UL 3401. Because we're doing it in a facility, we're able to have a much higher level of quality control to ensure that we're meeting the stringent standards that UL has laid out in, their uh, in that 3401. And it also means that we can certify our units at the state level so that when we get to the local deployment, we only need uh, permits from the local jurisdictions for the facility, for the foundation, utilities, and other limited site work. So Alex will take you a bit through the actual production process now. Yeah, so it, we actually, once we invented this material uh, that we literally can build uh, houses with, uh, we innovate a lot in 3D printing, but 3D printing alone is not enough to, 
to actually serve the construction industry. So this material in a new technology that uh, allow us to print these components and modules and volumetric module also allow us to actually rethink the manufacturing process. So uh, beside 3D printing, we also have 3D scanning with robotics, automated uh, wall texturing and automated PU form insulation. So all is done automatically. And we, we call this concept at the mighty factory production process, which being product agnostic. And the product agnostic approach was uh, actually possible only uh, with this material. And we also have a number of materials in our pipeline that are gonna be introduced um, next year and uh, later. So this is a couple of uh, examples of what we can print. On the left, for instance, you see building component, component that are right now used in this uh, Mighty Studio units. It's a small backyard uh, units that we sell to customers in California. In the middle, it's um, a picture of uh, our internal test that we were testing like a wavy service, surface and uh, accuracy that we can achieve. And on the right side, it's a more traditional 3D printed panels assembled together. So we actually, with a single production line and production process, we can achieve and, and build actually very you know, complex geometries in more standard building components. And part of this success was also uh, taking into account uh, the regulatory requirements, and that's influenced a lot on how we actually uh, develop this material. And one part of the material, as soon as we speak about 3D printing, it's also the process. So that's where we utilize simulation a lot. And uh, the simulation process help us actually to predict such things as a performance of a 3D printed part to optimize the geometry or material usage and even predict the curing degree. That help us a lot in terms of like before producing the prototype or, or going into production mode, we actually can iterate hundreds of times and solve the uh, minor issues in the design and uh, basically to ensure the first time right print. That's where we collaborate a lot with Hex, uh, with MSC software as a part of Hexagon uh, group of companies. And all this, uh, what we develop is right now incorporated in our product lines. So we have two product lines, which is ADUs and uh, kind of like single family home starter concept. So, and you can see that all these units are right now and available in California. And those are the first uh, officially um, building unit that are ready for commercial scale because of what we did uh, in a regulatory space with the material with the technology that is right now certified. So this is a couple of the examples, actually the units that we delivered uh, this year. So on the left, it's a unit in uh, San Ramon, in the middle, it's the San Diego. And those units uh, were delivered to a customer and uh, officially permitted. Um, and yeah, th those are my ticket system and the new product line that are gonna be released somewhat next year. Uh, the difference, the bigger difference of this, this is uh, these structures have a bigger percentage of 3D printed components. And um, the thing that we're gonna produce is a mighty kit, uh, kind of like panelized system that's gonna be assembled on site to uh, increase the efficiency. So thank you very much for this award. And uh, we're really like looking forward to actually participate next year with the new inventions uh, that uh, we're cooking, cooking in our R&D labs. Thank you very much, and uh, we're ready to answer the questions. Well, thank you very much. Very informative, Sam and Alexi. So we do have one uh, question, and I've got a couple. I always have some questions. But uh, does the UV cure resin have any inherent or added fire resistance? And if so, to what level? Uh, yes, yeah, so we've uh, developed our formulation to take into account fire safety, since that's one of the biggest issues within code compliance for structures. So we've already achieved a certified class A flame thread rating on it, and we're doing additional certified testing over the next few months and anticipate getting a one and like, more likely a two hour fire rating on the material for, as an exterior use. Another question that we have is, are you guys to develop this building to more than one storied buildings? If yes, how will be the stability of the building during a natural disaster like earthquake? Uh, yes, we, uh, we are. We're, it'll likely be another couple of years and that'll be based on some of the, uh, the new innovations that we're cooking up in the lab that Alex was referring to. Uh, but we are excited to move to multi-story and obviously being in California, we'll be, design it and develop it to fully account for earthquakes. 
um, as we have with our current units. Another question that we have is, uh, do these require much in the way of foundations to be installed? We've actually designed them to go on pretty much any type of foundation, depending on the needs of the specific site. So many of them are just slab on grade, but for more complex sites, we can easily do concrete piers, helical piers, skirts, uh, really whatever's needed for the site, because we have an integrated subfloor into, in the units. Yeah, the, the type of foundation is normally dictated by the type of the soil and the, the site where it should be installed. Uh, this is always a goodie when you get something like this one. Uh, is the material used in environmental, environment friendly? And is there any plan to using recycled materials in the future? Yeah, so the material we're using uh, that we've developed, one of the cool things is because of our production system, we can do zero waste production. So we're eliminating the three to five pounds per square foot that goes to landfill in a normal build. And the other cool thing is like when we're doing that milling process that you saw in one of those uh, slides, we're actually able to capture that and you reuse that as material filler in our in new material. And we're also in conversation with some uh, large companies for use of some pre, uh, pre consumer waste as recycled material for uh, filler as well. Okay, and last question, and then we need to get on to our next presentation. Does your resin incorporate graphene? Have you tried it? It does not, um, but one of the issues is that because it utilizes light, graphene does not allow light to pass through particularly well. So it's something we've looked at, but is not has thus far have not been able to find a way to leverage it. Well, thank you very much for your presentation, uh, Sam and Alexi, and congratulations to Mighty Buildings for winning the CAMEX uh, Unsurpassed Innovation Award. Congratulations. Thank, Thank you. you so much. So now we are gonna get on to our next segment of awards. Um, and these awards are for Composites Excellence or ACE. This is a prestigious composites industry competition, recognizes outstanding achievement and innovation in technology, manufacturing and product development. The American Composites Manufacturers Association is the host to this long-standing awards program, and we will present to you today six awards in three categories, which includes design, manufacturing, and market growth. So leading up, our first presenter uh, for this year's design category, Most Creative Application Award, recognizes evidence of significantly replacing traditional materials or innovative use or refinement of existing composite materials that impact current or new markets. The winner of this is University of Tennessee. Our presenter will be Marshall Prado. Marshall is an assistant professor of design and structural technology at UT. He holds a Bachelor of Architecture and a Bachelor of Environmental Design from North Carolina State University with advanced degrees of a Master of Architecture and a Master of Design Studies and Technology from Harvard University Graduate Schools of Design. Marshall previously taught at University of Stuttgart in the Institute of Computational Design and Construction, the University of Hawaii, and has been an invited studio critic at the University of Virginia, Carnegie Mellon University, and University of Michigan. He has led several workshops on design, digital design, and fabrication techniques. His current research interests include integrated computational design and robotic fabrication of lightweight fiber composite systems for architectural applications and spatial design strategies. The award winner is the UTK Filament Tower. So with that, Marshall, the podium is all yours. Uh, thanks a lot, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Uh, so uh, thanks for letting me come to speak to you today about my research on the UTK filament tower and thanks for the award as well. Um, my research team uh, took a look into uh, biological specimens in order to abstract and transfer performative principles into architectural applications. And since most biological systems are fibrous in nature, uh, made of materials like cellulose, collagen, silks, and chitin fibers, um, these ideas can often be utilized for similar materials such as the glass and carbon fibers we use in our technical composites. And so, um, as many of you know, these are 
often used in highly engineered applications which take advantage of these performative materials. Though most of the fabrication processes used at a large architectural scale still rely on large surface molds and uh, waste a lot of material in developing that or, or reduce the process to a serialized production um, scenario. And so architecture is often um, more complex and dynamic than this in the sense that it, we rarely make the same building more, more than once. Um, so, so these processes are, are therefore neither transferable nor applicable for architectural applications without being limited to design exploration or system performance. And so I, I focus on developing alternative fabrication strategies that might be better suited to the constraints of architecture, specifically exploring novel processes called coreless filament winding, which as the name suggests, does not require a surface mold. And this opens up more possibilities for adaptive fabrication processes to create a wider range of component geometries with less waste. And this research um, builds on several composite projects that I worked on at the Institute of Computational Design in Stuttgart, where we explored dome-like structures or expansive roof systems or large cantilevering uh, structures. And in each case, we, uh, we developed novel computational design or robotic fabrication systems tailored to the structure we were trying to make. These varied widely from project to project, depending on if we were exploring the maximum flexibility and the component geometry, or uh, a simplified setup with high precision for adaptable winding sequences. And um, we were able to test how these composites might interface with other sort of building systems. So you can see this process here where we wound glass and carbon fiber on a standardized frame, and we were able to use a, a multi-stage winding process to produce more volumetric, volumetrically enclosed geometries that wouldn't have been possible with a surface mold. Other scenarios explored scalability of large scale architectural structures beyond the size of an individual robotic system. And in this case, we explored autonomous drones as a way of transport, transporting fibers from various winding positions to en enable a larger scale construction. Um, and so last year I, I received a grant to make an architectural exhibition in Columbus, Indiana. Um, and if you don't know Columbus, it has a rich architectural heritage of iconic buildings, particularly those with towers. And this is a structural scenario that I, I hadn't explored in previous projects. So that was really interesting. And so um, I worked with a set of um, really great students, collaborators and sponsors at the University of Tennessee to explore, um, explore this project and wanted to, wanted to work on several developments of the previous processes, specifically the tower topology, as well as a skeletal structure rather than a surface structure to reduce the material use. We looked at the Chala cactus skeleton um, and worked with the entomology and plant pathology department at the uh, University of Tennessee to get microscopic images of the structure uh, and the fibers as well as distilling out fiber directionalities in the structure and understanding the continuous biaxial lattice system. So if you, if you think of how, um, I mean, this provided some really interesting insights. So if you compare this to how we typically make a lattice structure, say in a space truss or a geodesic dome, the systems are often made from simple struts that are produced from standardized material and the complexity in the system is really stored in the, in the node or the, the joint, which have to connect these struts at different angles. And in this example, you'd have 17 components with complex non-planar non or discontinuous joints at the intersections of this biaxial lattice. An alternative strategy we proposed was to have a continuous material across the intersections with standard planar connections. Um, and this would require only six components. Uh, this would be possible if we didn't rely on standardized uh, material stock and could wind these multinodal composite components. And so we started um, designing this tower with this in mind by using these you know, six interconnected columns that we you know, discretized into rough component geometry and then could simulate the self-forming winding process on these geometries, apply some structural analysis to determine where we would further need to reinforce it with carbon afterwards. So the result was a 30-foot tower uh, made from unique 
fiber composite components. Each one of these building blocks was composed of a glass fiber body and uh, carbon fiber structural reinforcement. Um, the components had several nodes which connected along the columns and to neighboring, neighboring components as well. And this multinodal system helped reduce the number of components that we needed to fabricate. The center of the tower was open. Uh, you can go inside and look all the way up through the, the crown. And the fiber composite components were anchored to benches at the, at the bottom, which were 3D printed as ballast or foundations for the tower. The overall tower covered about 85 square feet. The, uh, the benches were manufactured in cooperation with the Oak Ridge National Laboratory and their manufacturing demonstration facility. They have a big area additive manufacturing printer that they allowed us to use. And it's one of the largest in the world for this type of uh, 3D printing as well. The fiber composite components were manufactured at the University of Tennessee's Fab Lab, where we have a nine axis robotic setup uh, that we put in place last year. And we are able to CNC mill, fiber wind, and most recently, uh, large scale 3D printing as well. The robotic setup was arranged kind of like a rotisserie where fibers would be laid on a frame rotating around a central axis. And this is um, very similar to many um, fiber winding machines that, that you might see in the industry. Uh, our setup had a reconfigurable frame made of a kit of parts that could be assembled with the assistance of the, of the robot and could be reconfigured, reconfigured for all the components in the tower. The winding stage shown here was a bit messy as it was a wet, wet winding process, but the fibers were stretched from winding point to winding point, which was slowly built into a structured surface over time. A lot of research went into the development of the winding sequence to create this surface without a mold. Shown here at a faster speed, it looks deceivingly simple and repetitive, although the uh, complex winding process really enabled the structured surface to be fabricated with a wide variety of components. In total, we had 27 composite components that were all unique and three 3D printed um, bases that were all shipped up to Columbus last August and assembled on site um, in less than a week. And it had an amazing backdrop of North Christian Church by uh, architect Errol Saarinen, uh, where it had an architectural dialogue really between the, the two towers um, uh, together. The tower had this unique material presence that attracted visitors to the site. The components were lit at night from the inside, which created this dramatic effect from the glass and carbon fiber. And the experience from day to night changed quite a bit as we were hoping the tower could be seen as a beacon for the Columbus event. The research presented here explores a range of computational robotic and material processes for fabricating the lightweight composite tower structures. In the future, I'd like to explore a wider range of multinodal, to, multinodal topologies and increase the geometric complexity possible for architectural applications. I'd also like to point out that I'm always looking for interesting collaborations to develop this research. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marshall. That was really great. Uh, we got a couple of questions so far, but uh, one quick question. The time of concept to fabrication, can you kind of put that in a time frame of what it took to do that? Um, that was roughly nine months to a year from when I, when I received the grant to um, when it had to be installed. So we, and you we had a nice started... use of uh, both glass fiber and carbon fiber. Um, I didn't catch the resins that you were using. We used um, uh, a Hexion Epicure Epicote resin, um, uh, which was one of our one of our material sponsors that we used. Uh, question has also come in: Are the benches from the thermoplastic uh, BAM at Oak Ridge or thermoset like the tower? They're thermoplastic, so they're a, a carbon fiber reinforced ABS. Next question we got is, how does column load capacity compare to more traditional building columns? Um, so, I mean, this was an experimental structure, so it was, it was only meant to be self-supporting, though um, we did do some non-destructive load tests to see if it would support the design uh, structural requirements. 
Um, I, I think they could easily be tailored to a variety of structural needs, depending on how much material you can put on them. Um, uh, we only sort of uh, load tested them up to the amount that we needed, which was really just to support our own weight for construction. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we're out of time, but thank you very much for a, a very wonderful, uh, comprehensive uh, presentation. And we hope to see more of this from University of Tennessee or whatever university you wind up going, maybe back to Hawaii or something like that. But congratulations on winning the award. Thank, Thank you. you. Our uh, next uh, award winner is uh, for the manufacturing category uh, for Equipment and Tooling Innovation Award is presented to the product that recognizes equipment, tooling, production, production aid or software that is designed to improve manufacturing production, environmental sustainability, or product quality or performance in composites manufacturing. Our presenter today is Kelvin Fu from the University of Delaware. Kelvin Fu is an assistant professor of mechanical engineering at the University of Delaware, where he directs the composites and additive manufacturing laboratory in the mechanical engineering department. His current research is focused on materials and manufacturing innovation, in multi-scale composite design, manufacturing, and applications involving with machine learning, intelligent manufacturing, materials synthesis, and characterizations. The product who has, that has won the award is called 3D Printing Continuous Carbon Fiber Thermoset Composites. Kelvin, the floor is all yours. Okay, thanks. Thanks, John, for the introduction. Hello, everyone. My name is Kelvin Fu. I'm an assistant professor in mechanical engineering at U Delaware, and also I'm PI in my lab called Compartments and, Adi and Additive Manufacturing Lab. And my lab is mainly focusing on multi-scale fibers and composites, right? Uh, like the, in the innovation, including uh, manufacturing applications. And my team and I are very excited to receive this award in the Manufacturing Equipment and Tooling Innovation Award. And so today I will cover the scientific part and also some details of my design uh, of our product, our technology. So which is called uh, LITA 3D printing of continuous carbon fiber reinforced thermoset components. So as you know, the 3D printing of continuous carbon fiber with thermoset is a big challenge, right? No matter in academia or industry. So my lab and my group, I mean, we are just giving some 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 trials, right, to uh, to address some key challenges, okay, in this area. And okay, so this is our basic design, and we call this LITA technology. This is a localized implant thermal assisted 3D printing technology, and we believe this is the first 3D printer, okay, to enable continuous carbon fiber and thermal set components. So we can achieve simultaneous wetting, wicking as well as curing and solidification. So there's no additional post-treatment so from our uh, 3D printing I mean, technology. And also we believe this is the all-in-one design because we are using the commercial available carbon fibers and also the commercial available resin. So we don't use UV curable polymers. And just using our uh, lab developed printing head, so it's easy to print any shapes of uh, composite structures. And also now in my lab, we are trying to scale up this technology to design large 3D uh, printers to enable us to use like carbon fiber tapes or carbon fiber uh, fabrics, right? To print some large samples. And also based on our uh, basic, I mean, uh, experiments. So you can see we can achieve kind of like pretty high fiber volume fraction, like the 60%. And also the mechanical property are comparable, okay, with uh, <clears throat> the, the current, I mean, or the traditional carbon fiber composites. Okay, so uh, on the bottom, you can see our schematic. So we developed this 3D printing uh, head and it's controlled by robot arm. So we have a epoxy resin chamber to deposit the resin directly onto the carbon fibers. And here we introduce a, a heater. So shows here is a red, red rod. So that one can contact with our carbon fiber directly to generate the heat, okay? And also, uh, so in the middle of the, the, the image, you can see that's our uh, Gen 1, the generation one of our, our printer. 
and here we show the demonstration by using carbon fiber filament, okay, to do the printing. And here's the details of the, the, the generation one design. And here we in, invent this heater. So by using carbon nanotubes, because carbon nanotube is very uh, highly, I mean, uh, conductive, uh, the, the structure. And also if we apply the electricity, okay, so we can quickly control the heating rate. And also, uh, here you can see the nozzle. The nozzle will adapt the gradients onto the fibers, and the heat can transfer okay along the fibers toward the other end. So in this case, we can create a gradient temperature distribution on fibers. So once those fibers step it onto the cold area, so due, due to the capillary force and driven by the gradient temperature, so this epoxy resin or the liquid, okay, they can uh, spontaneously flow toward the higher temperature so during this flow process so we can achieve the the simult we call this simultaneous okay wetting and wicking as well as the the curing process okay so here is our schematic and also the 3d printer hat design and here it's the printing uh, principle design pr principle and once we apply the heater so we can control the temperature it actually depends on the the thermal property of our liquid resins so once we apply the heater, so you can see we can create a gradient distribution along the fibers from the low to the high temperature, right? And because of this, so we can control the viscosity, the contact angle of the uh, liquid resin with our carbon fiber. Actually, it depends on the geometry of the fiber structures, as well as the, the, the thermal and chemical properties of resins. So in this case, we introduce another factor called KS. Okay, so this number will, I mean, will go from low to the high. So this, this is the motivation for our liquid resin to, to I mean, spontaneous, spontaneously transport toward the higher, higher directions. Okay, so in the, on, on the right side, you can see, so fibers actually, they are poor structures, right? They have a low tautiosity design because all the fibers are aligned, okay, in one direction. So actually we are using this, this weakened behavior or the, the capillary force to, <clears throat> to okay. So here we gave the equations. So it's kind of like hard to, uh, to, to do the calculation, but you can see I use different colors to, to indicate different functions. So the right color just show the, the liquid resin properties, right? It gives the, the densities, the surface energy, as well as the viscosity. We know that all those factors are influenced or they can be impacted by the temperatures, right? So on the, you can see for the green color, so that is about the uh, carbon fiber geometry. So if we change from the carbon fiber filament to the tape or to a fabric, so we can create different cardiosity, right? The, the different, those uh, key numbers like the R0, right? With different carbon fiber diameters. So in this case, we can also change our liquid absorption coefficient Ks. And the third one, you can see that uh, the blue color is the contact angle. So contact angle actually indicates the, the we can say it's the uh, interaction, okay, or relationship between the fibers with the, with the liquid resin. So by, I mean, manipulating all those parameters so we can well control okay, the flow rate, the flow speed, and also the curing kinetics, okay, into our system. So here, just to give an example, so low cost, I mean, BPA thermostat resin from the uh, market. And also we measure it's a viscosity versus temperature, as well as uh, the surface tension versus the temperature. So we put everything to the calculation into this equation. So then we get the KS value, it's a liquid absorption coefficient. And you can see, uh, at the lower temperature, so the KS value is kind of like low, but once the temperature goes to 60 and or 80, so that increases. So the increase of the KS value indicates that more capability, okay, from our resin and carbon fiber system, okay, can contribute to the absorption capability. So the higher number means faster, okay, so for the, for the resin to be absorbed into our carbon fiber system. And here we carry out the experiment by using the IR image to capture the, the, the temperature distribution. As we can see, 
okay so right here so that is our uh, hot temperature so we apply the, the the heat to our carbon fibers and uh, also on the the vert i mean the horizontal direction that's our carbon fiber filament or carbon fiber toe so you can see very clearly a uh, gradient thermal distribution okay from like a uh, 50 degrees C to a high temperature and when we drop the liquid on the cold area or the cold zone so we can monitor the temperature so on the right side you can see that the temperature distribution okay so a, a little bit increase okay for the red one the red one is the, the later curing so the increase of temperature that is coming from the uh, uh, exothermic reaction of the epoxy resins okay so this confirms okay our like the gradient temperature distribution can actually I mean, react and start triggering the, the, the reaction and curing of our epoxy. And next, okay, so here just show some of the uh, very simple demonstration. So we apply the Joule heater as the, I mean, our controlled temperature heater. So if the heater is on, so you can see the epoxy, epoxy ribbon can be, uh, I mean, uh, wetting and uh, wicking to our carbon fiber toe and they can flow toward the high temperature. But if the temperature is off, like the Joule heater is off, so the epoxy resin can only stay on the surface of carbon fibers. So which means no wicking, no wetting, of course, no, uh, no curing. So once we move our, the Joule heater, okay, touching the, the carbon fiber along the surface of the carbon fibers. So, and then we deposit the, the liquid resin. So you can see the whole filament surface can be cured. Okay, and on the- Dr. Fu, we're running out of time here. Okay, so I will be quick. Okay, so in this image on the, on the third one, you can see we can do the vertical printing. So that means in the future, we can do the, the outer space printing with lower or non-gravity. All right, so this is our uh, Gen 1 concept demonstration. We can print in different ways and we can do the vertical and horizontal printing. And the third one, uh, I mean, the, the last image is our generation two we are working on. So to, um, to, to, to print some large scale samples. So here just show uh, the, the scanning electron microscope and also the mechan mechanical properties. All right, so uh, that's the conclusion. So if you are interested in this work, so please go and check this paper. So we provide more details. And also we are looking for collaboration and investment to, uh, to do for the work, okay, for these printers. Okay, all right, thank you. That's all the, the yeah. Thank you, Dr. Fu. So uh, one question did come up and uh, uh, the question is, since the resin is placed first, when printing an actual part, must a sacrificial start position always take place? Uh, yes, that's true. So we have to do some, I mean, tiny post treatment, yeah, to, uh, to cut the, like the sacrificial part or something like that. You know, and one uh, one last question I have is, uh, uh, what kind of challenges do you see in scale up for this process? Oh, okay. So you know, this tech technology comes from my lab. So we need help. I mean, in the the software and the modeling control and how to control the pathway, and also uh, like we need to do some of the surface modification of the fibers as well as like the the liquid resin to make sure the resin can flow and cure spontaneously, yeah. Well, thank you very much. Uh, mm -hmm. We are out of questions and out of time, but we'd like to thank you and congratulations on winning the award. Okay, thank you. Let's proceed on to our uh, next presenter. Our next category, ACE category, is in manufacturing. Uh, the award is Material and Process Innovation. This is the, uh, this particular award, which recognizes the entry that demonstrates use of innovative materials, production techniques, or methods that result in better quality, reduced production cost, increased production rates and volume, or reduced life cycle costs. The award goes to TRB Lightweight Structures. Andrew Dugmore will be our presenter. Andrew is the president of TRB Lightweight Structures and has been working in the composites engineering industry since 1991 and previously served as the chairman of Composites UK. 
Andrew has excellent knowledge of polymers, thermoset, and thermoplastics, and has been instrumental in utilizing this knowledge in the development of the Fast Press Cure. The award winner is called Fast Press Cure, a disruptive high volume composite manufacturing method. With that, the podium is all yours, Andrew. That's great. Thank you very much. Appreciate that, John. Also, I'd like to thank all the uh, sponsors um, and, and everyone involved in this award. We, uh, we really appreciate it. So uh, in the next 10 minutes, I'm just going to explain a little bit about how we found a couple of problems in the world of composites and manufacturing and how we've resolved those and how they're in place now in our facility in Richmond in Kentucky. Um, so uh, we've been manufacturing thermoset composite components for a number of years. And some of the problems that we face from customers are really been around uh, how we increase from low volume up to mid and especially to high volume. One of the challenges, so we've had two challenges with, uh, with, with this. One of them really is around at the moment, there's still very much a manual process. So uh, uh, and that only enables you to really look at low volume. So still very labor intensive, often going through a slow cure process. So something like an, an autoclave or out of oven um, technology. And then the other one as well, the, the problems that we face and have seen with composites working alongside closely with customers and partners are the cost of the materials. If you, if you solve the number one and, and can reduce the, the, um, the labor, then the materials themselves is still always been a challenge. So it's very important for us as a business to look at how we solve both of these um, as opposed to just solving one of them. So the next couple of slides just explains a little bit about how we've, uh, how we've done that. So the first, uh, the first tackle um, or area that we tackled really is, uh, so this is called FPC process. So this process is now longer, uh, not using an autoclave and a, and a, and a slower uh, ramping up and dwell and ramp down process, but this is now a fast press curing under vacuum. So this now allows us to um, certainly uh, reduce the time taken to manufacture the component and subsequently the impressions per tool. So uh, increasing to volume. We typically see now the whole process, we've got this down to about nine minutes at the moment and um, th there's still further that we can do now. That's on an example of a component that took well into about three hours actually to make by, by hand. The second challenge um, was uh, then putting everything in line. So what's really important for this is really getting to a much higher um, yield of uh, automation. So us as a, uh, as a business, we have a lot of um, experience in the manufacturing of materials. Uh, we have a lot of IP in different resin systems from epoxy systems to cyanate ester systems, um, uh, etc. And so what we're doing now is we've really solved the, the challenge in terms of the material costs. So now we're actually manufacturing the material and, and in our site in, uh, in Richmond in Kentucky. So we're now manufacturing the, the material on our own pre brig lines. So these are lines that we have actually manufactured ourselves uh, and bespoke to, to the resin systems and the requirements of, um, of specific customers. Um, what I'll show next. So we go from pre-preg line right the way through from what we call the off wind straight on to the kick cut. So we're then uh, cutting the materials. So there's no freezing. There's no packaging requirements. They're going straight into kick cut. We're then going straight into what we are um, our FPC cure system. And then from the curing system straight into uh, D flash trimming deburring and then straight on to some customers require metallic insert still in some applications that we have. Um, so this is all again done by pick and place. And then um, another example is the liquid gasket. Um, so for some customers who require IP67 uh, as an example, and we've put this, this is all now in line. 
what I have next on the on the next slide is to um, show that in our animation. We're not currently showing it on on the actuals at the moment because of some IP on uh, some of the things that we want to keep to ourselves at this point. But uh, th this shows a really good example here. So hopefully you guys can see this, and I'll explain as we go through. So as I mentioned, so um, we're actually um, manufacturing the materials. Uh, the the speed is the same speed that we have set on the run rate, which is the same as the flow of material through the kick cut, and then um, uh, robotic pick and placement onto a onto a tool. It then goes into a press. We can utilize the press with multi platens. So in this animation, this is just a single a single daylight, uh, but we do have multi daylights that we also use. This process goes through a cure uh, system. And then once this is cured, this is then released. Uh, we can then perform, and we do now, the trimming and deburring of the component. Uh, and then we also now are, so again, this is our own machine that we've designed and developed as well. Uh, so this is pick and placement of metallic inserts uh, uh, showing on, uh, on this as an example. And then in this line, we've got, we actually have a uh, liquid gasket for a customer that's uh, required. And then, um, and then that's the end of that, uh, that process. So yeah, very uh, short presentation there. And uh, just to explain a little bit about uh, what it is that we're doing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, appreciate the presentation and the video. It always helps to see something that's in, in process. And uh, thank you for staying late after work in the UK. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure it's a little late uh, at this point in time. So a couple of questions have come in. One is um, when we're thinking about uh, production efficiency, um, can we integrate uh, Q&A into this with a uh, a non-destructive evaluation of what's happening with the part to allow for inspection later on. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, it's actually something that we are, it's not until about Q2 next year that we have that. So uh, at the moment, this is a is a is still a hand process, um, but this has been integrated and can be easily integrated, but this is not until kind of around about Q2 of, uh, of next year. There are additional processes as well to this that we can add to this, so we can go further down uh, downstream so uh, we're also looking at the weaving technology as well adding because at the moment we're buying in the the fabric in a in a in a woven state so yeah sure yep another question that has come in how robust is the pick and place system in carrying green material if the material has fiber still attached to the raw stock material yeah, so the beauty of us making our own um, uh, materials. So if you look at the pick and place, because there's two pick and places. So if the question's around the pick and place from the um, the material itself, the the um, prepreg material, then uh, what we actually do there is we are able to use the off wind to take the. So we have a protection poly. So when you buy a material, you have a protection um, poly on it for transport. When you're making your own materials, you don't actually need that um, that poly. So you're able to go take the material straight and put the plies together in the in the orientation that's required and you don't actually have to take off the uh, backing because our resin systems often when you buy a prepreg material you buy it with a specific tack level because you have to you lay that up by hand traditionally when you're not laying it up by hand you no longer need the tack level and I just have a, oh, another one just popped in will the products fully customized, will the products fully customized or pre-designed? Yeah, so uh, as, a, as a business, we, be, we do both actually. So we work alongside with, um, with our customers and partners. Sometimes um, it is a, a build to print as we would call it in the, in the UK. Uh, sometimes we are um, the design and, and also the material selection for the customer as well. So we actually do do both. It's probably about 50% uh, of each for, for us as a business. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, congratulations on winning the Material and Process Innovation ACE Award. Uh, very well uh, deserved. Thank you. Thank you.
I'd like to get to our next uh, presenter. Uh, the next category is Market Growth Composite Sustainability Award. This award is presented to the composites product that clearly demonstrates an improvement in the environmental impact of the product's use. The composite product must support the attributes of sustainability as defined by the product's use and end of life phase and sustainable development. The product must also demonstrate one or more of the following in the use phase. Energy water emissions are either conserving or creating or the end of life phase, which includes demolition disposal and or recycling. The uh, winner of this particular award is given to Lando Bassell. Uh, our presenter is Kerry Nunley. Kerry works as the business development manager of composites for Lando Bazell, uh, working with engineered composites in building, construction, and mobility applications. Kerry has over 15 years of experience in manufacturing, leadership, quality, technical, marketing, and sales. And he will be joined also with Chad Nun Nunnery with Composite Access Products. Chad is president and founder of Composite Access Products, has 25 years of experience in material properties, <clears throat> market application, molding processes, part design, and global industry relationships. He has led several startup operations, two in Mexico, one in Brazil, and one in the USA. So with that, the podium is yours, gentlemen, uh, Kerry and Chad. Thanks, John. I appreciate it. Uh, and, and once again, thanks for this award and the opportunity to, to share this story. I am proud to be joined by our innovation partner in this, uh, Chad, uh, who will get to tell you all, all about the, the composite access products business in just a second. Um, first, we would like to tell you just a little bit about uh, Lyman Devacell before we get to CAP and then some of uh, the advantages of BMC in this application. And um, Lion Del Vassell may not be a household name, but we are uh, in fact one of the largest global uh, providers for plastics, chemicals, and uh, refining opportunities. Uh, to give you a sense of our size and scope, we're the number one producer of polyethylene in Europe, number one for polypropylene in North America and Europe, number one for oxy fuels in North America and Europe, and number one for polypropylene compounds globally. So we are, uh, we are a very, very large uh, global provider. Uh, you can see our global footprint here. We have manufacturing and joint ventures in 22 countries and products that are sold in more than 100 countries. And we have five key areas. Uh, where we do business, that's in the chemicals area, polymers area, advanced polymers, fuels. Terry, yes. Terry, I don't think you're showing your uh, screen. Uh, it says I am. Well. ACMA control, do you see the screen? Nope, I do not see your screen, Terry. Give me just a second. I'll try again. You were sounding really good, but I knew you were looking to the to the slides and uh, there weren't any. Hmm. There you go. Get into presentation mode, you'll be good. How about now? There you go. You All got right. it. <laughs> Well, here's where we were. Um, I was uh, just reviewing um, Lion Del Vassell and our, and our global footprint. We kind of already talked through this uh, as far as uh, some of the areas where we're market leaders. This is the global footprint of Lion Del Vassell, uh, where we have 22 joint ventures and manufacturing sites across, uh, across the world and products sold in more than 100 countries. And then this is the five uh, focus areas we have at Lion Del Vassell in the chemicals, polymers, advanced polymers, fuels, and technologies. And advanced polymers is where our engineered composites business sits, where we do the, the BMC that uh, Chad uses for the manhole covers, as well as SMCs, uh, quantum products, carbon fiber products, and such. So with that, 
um, Chad will come online and talk to you about uh, products in the, uh, this particular area. Okay, thanks, Carrie. Uh, yeah, so uh, to give a little background on CAP, I actually work for uh, Lyndell Bissell. Prior to Lyndell Bissell, it was uh, Citadel Plastics uh, two owners ago. I grew up in the, in the world of uh, BMCs, um, trying to find uh, and, and give uh, value to other applications, convert metal over to composites, started operations uh, in different parts of Latin America primarily. Um, and we saw this application, the manhole cover and other parts of the world. Uh, China did a, had a huge growth on this application after a, a 240,000 covers were actually stolen in one summer in Beijing. Um, that's a, it's an amazing quantity. Um, and, and they solved that with composite because you couldn't uh, easily um, convert this, the scrap metal. There was no, there was no metal. It's, it's difficult to convert uh, this material. And, uh, and so that was a, a primary boost there. In the United States, there really weren't any uh, compression molders or there aren't um, of composites for manhole covers that are traffic rated. Uh, there are some RTM and we saw that, some resin transfer molded products. So uh, we saw this as an opportunity. Uh, I talked to my former employer at the time, Citadel Plastics, um, and, and said, hey, we'll, we'll grow this market together. We can add more value with our formulation knowledge, our uh, ideas about how to improve the manhole cover in a composite way, uh, in a compression molded uh, BMC that has some special sauce to make it uh, traffic rated. Um, you know, we uh, were actually adding affordability as well. So we're, we're getting more towards the cost, uh, po the price points of, uh, of an iron, a cast iron product. Um, we, uh, we started molding our own product and actually 2017 took us a couple of years uh, to get uh, part design, get all the, the equipment and, and molds designed uh, and, uh, and go ahead and change the slide there, Kerry. Um, and right now we're actually installed in over 300 municipalities, and including some, uh, some very major ones uh, like Fort Worth, Texas, San Antonio, Texas, uh, with Fulton County, Georgia, so 13 cities around Atlanta. We're starting to talk to many other cities, LA, uh, all over, you know, Florida really has adopted this uh, technology in, in several cities. Um, and it's, uh, it's really taking off quickly in, in a matter of three years, really three and a half years. Uh, we're seeing about three to five new cities a week at this point, uh, starting to get specifications, getting their mold designs. Um, the composite uh, manhole cover offers a lot of benefits. Uh, the compression molded version um, is more affordable for several reasons. And, uh, and so I can first go through this uh, benefits slide. Uh, a lot of these benefits have been known for 20 years. Um, and and we've, we're adding a, a couple more here. Corrosion resistance, uh, when an cast iron covers that are in the ground get corroded, primarily uh, from hydrogen sulfide that gets converted to sulfuric acid and just rips away at the frames and, and, and the covers uh, and fuses them together. Uh, the guys in the field have to take a sledgehammer and, and bang the heck out of it to open it up, which uh, eventually cracks the frames and cracks the covers. Um, composites don't, these composites are not corroding like the cast iron, uh, and so that is unnecessary. Uh, it's unsafe to take a sledgehammer to a, a, a manhole cover as well. You get rocks and things bouncing off into people's eyes and, and hurting their backs. Uh, also along that line of safety, composite covers are about half to one third the weight. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that because there's an interesting point there. Um, uh, the, um, the original covers, and, and they're still there today, uh, the RTM, the resin transfer molded variety, are actually quite a bit lighter than the compression molded variety. Um, they're, they have a higher strength to weight ratio, but we still have uh, acceptable strength. The thing is that the weight, uh, too low of a weight, can be a problem as well. Um, so this compression molded variety of composite the, the, um, is in a kind of a Goldilocks position of not too heavy and not too light. Um, we feel, and, and many others feel, that an RTM can be too light of a, of a manhole cover. Um, load capacity, we're, we're achieving incredible um, loads on a 9 inch by 9 inch uh, platen. We're putting over 140,000 pounds without a failure on one of these covers. Um, that's way beyond the traffic rated cover. 
uh, infiltration inflow, that actually has become the number one issue and, and um, it's been great for us. Uh, we, we found out that thinking, making a watertight cover had some value and there are things about composites uh, that uh, are, give advantage to making a watertight uh, product. Um, sand cast iron is made with multiple molds um, and uh, compri compression mold composites. We use one mold to make every cover and every frame. So there's a natural reduction in part to part variation. Uh, we can we gasket all of our covers. Uh, it's easier to align um, a cover if you need to bolt it uh, than you would with an iron cover because the iron covers can get up to 400 pounds. Um, so aligning a bolt hole is very difficult and it is very important to have some type of fastening system in order to achieve watertight. Why is watertight important? Well, the rainwater actually uh, is not supposed to go into the sewer systems. Uh, when it does, it overflows the system and then you have uh, toxic waste uh, and other things in your rivers, lakes and streams. Actually, it's considered the number one cause of water pollution, 32 trillion gallons a year of water pollution are caused by sanitary sewer overflows. So making the system watertight uh, confines the, uh, the input to the system to just the sanitary stuff and not the rainwater and things that do not need to be processed and will eventually overflow the system. Um, so um, I've covered a lot of these uh, elements here already, but uh, some, some other things that we're looking at as well is transmission, data transmission. We don't have to uh, drill a hole through our covers, like an iron cover, you have to drill a hole to put an antenna through it to transmit data. Uh, and we uh, have everything contained underneath the cover and there are um, interesting technologies that people are putting on manhole covers these days. Uh, we're gonna be introducing a product uh, coming up that does transmit uh, information um, uh, through the cover. Uh, today we have a cover that where we encapsulate uh, a radio frequency ID tag in the substrate uh, so that you can actually do asset management. Uh, go ahead and the next one, uh, Terry. And, uh, and so uh, with that RFID, you can, you can store information about what is in the, uh, in the manhole. If you have a, a air release valve, or if you, have, uh, if you wanna know how many inlets go to that space, we can store all that information in the manhole cover itself. Um, and, and that reduces the number of time that people, times that people have to open the cover. Um, versus RTM, you know, RTM has some advantages, as I mentioned, has a higher uh, strength to weight ratio. Um, but again, I see that at, at times as a disadvantage. Um, we can get finer details uh, with a compression molded, uh, the, the surface uh, on an RTM, uh, the detail tends to uh, be resin rich and uh, your, your surface treading and letters can wear off easily. So we have an advantage there. Um, the raw materials involved with our compression molded process are less expensive than you would have with the resin transfer molded system. Uh, we in mold our features like our holes uh, for fastening and, and other uh, hooks and other things. Um, post process drilling and machining uh, gets expensive and starts to expose filaments uh, for wicking. Um, we Chad, have, we're uh, going to need to wrap this up. All right, sorry. Um, and so that's, um, I guess I'll just wrap it up. Um, this, this photo shows a lot of things I've already talked about. We can do a lot of things that cast iron can't do, colors, stone-like appearances. We in mold encapsulate uh, magnets so that they can find them underground. There's a lot of things you can do with a composite versus an iron. And, and I think that's how, I think that's the last slide we've got. Thank you, Chad and Carrie. We have a couple of questions here, Chad. Uh, Iron covers are sometimes temporarily welded to prevent removal in case of special events. What sure. solution, if any, does CAP use to mimic the reversible security action? You can do um, special locks. All of our covers come with a fastening system uh, included, um, a locking system uh, with a special key, kind of like your lug nut on your, uh, on your tire can be used. Um, it's uh, again, you know, we, we don't do a lot of welding uh, of, com of thermoset composites, um, but, um, but yeah, there are other, other ways to do that, to achieve that. One other question, will there be any ideas like to detect blockage or overflow in a specific location? So yeah, there are already actually uh, these technologies uh, that attach to covers. 
um, and do uh, send a signal, uh, have a sensor in them. We are working with a company right now to, to incorporate that into the cover itself so it's not hanging below and it has a better sensor technology. But yes, that's happening today. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pretty expensive uh, system, but we're trying to work on the affordability of that as well. But yes, today there are sensors that measure many things, uh, hydrogen sulfide levels, uh, whether the cover is open or closed, many different pieces of data can be sensed and transmitted to a, an operator's device, handheld device. Well, thank you very much, Carrie and Chad. That's all the time we have for this segment. Uh, again, congratulations on winning the Market Growth Composite Sustainability Award. Thank you very Thanks, much. John. We will now proceed to our last presentation and uh, the esteemed Market Growth Infinite Possibility uh, for Market Growth Award. You like that? It's always double, double words in there. The Market Growth Award uh, for Infant Possibility is presented to the composites product that demonstrates the potential to significantly increase the use of composites in existing markets or generate the greatest impact to open new and emerging markets for composites. This product exemplifies innovation, creativity, and commercialization, leading to market growth. The award is presented to Iris School of Technology. Our presenter will be Bob Lacavera. Bob is currently the lead faculty of the Composites Technology Program at the Iris School of Technology in Newport, Rhode Island, and recently served as Interim Director of Education. Bob has served on the ACMA Board of Directors and is past president of the association and was a key developer of the association's certified composites technician. And oh, by the way, he's a CCTI and uh, spent 20 years as ACMA's technical director and my former colleague. So Bob, the podium is all yours and I'd love to be entertained. John, thank you. Well, we'll give that a try. Um, so uh, I'd like to walk you through the development of this particular project. Um, it's uh, necessary to uh, understand the, um, um, the, the, the uh, context that we developed this in. Um, and bear with me for just one moment on the slides. While I see if we can get those to come up, uh, screen sharing just stopped. And I think we've got it at this point. Um, uh, I apologize for that. Uh, I, 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 we Zoom a lot and I've never had screen share uh, cut out on me like that. Um, let me give you some background uh, on IRIS to uh, frame the context of this particular project. Uh, IRIS is a small trade school. Uh, Bob, can you go into presentation mode, please? I'm trying. When I do that, it is perfect. All right. We'll we'll see. The slides wouldn't switch before. And and again, sorry about this technical issue. Uh, Iris is a small trade school located uh, on our waterfront campus in uh, Newport, Rhode Island. Um, we have four programs in house: composites technology, digitally digital modeling and fabrication, boat building and restoration, and marine systems. Um, the Composites Technology Program is a 900-hour course. We start the students with the fundamentals of composites, uh, work through basic open molding technology. Along the way, the students are learning CAD modeling and CNC machining. We think this makes our program pretty unique in the scope of composites uh, educational programs with the combination of the digital aspects with the functional aspects of learning composites. Uh, the students will be engaged in mold making and tooling activities, vacuum infusion technologies, and advanced composites prepreg fabrication. As part of the program, uh, the, the students end their, uh, their program with a capstone project. And here are some examples of some of these capstone projects. Uh, a few years back, uh, we did a group project. Uh, we built a, a series of uh, one meter 
Um, wind turbines, uh, you can see the uh, student cohort there. We built four wind turbines. Each one of them had slightly different variations as the students worked through the design process, um, uh, but that worked out really interesting. Uh, individual projects, uh, you can see uh, this particular student developed uh, a, a historic model of an America's Cup boat. No one had ever built a model of this boat before because the specifications were hidden in some archive at MIT, which he was able to dig out. And this is the first model ever of this particular America's Cup hull. Um, here's an example of some individual recent capstone projects. Uh, included a sim racing rig, uh, a, a, what, what turned into a carbon fiber paddle blade, uh, an electric guitar, uh, some artsy 3D graffiti. Um, so the students are involved in these, um, in, in these capstone projects um, as the culmination, the consolidation of everything that they've learned during the course of a semester. Um, I have to mention that nine of our Irish, Irish graduates worked on the New York Yacht Club's um, America's Cup build for American Magic. Um, this is the highest of high-tech composites work going on in the United States at this point in time. And uh, the boat is currently uh, in the workup to the upcoming America's Cup. We're very proud of our graduates uh, who were working on this project. So let's take a look at the concept of our heavy lift aerial platform and where this started. Um, the, the capstone project discussion actually started with the class of 2015 in 2016, considering a worthy project. So we kind of landed on something that would fly. Um, it had to be useful. Nobody was enthused about doing a consumer like RC uh, drone, a typical drone. One of my requirements was it had to utilize a range of materials and processes, and it had to have some market possibilities. And of course, the students wanted some wow factor, uh, something that would they could get enthused about building. Um, so the concept developed toward this large uh, quadcopter idea um, and gravitated toward ducted fan uh, as the propulsion system. Um, it had to be able to carry useful loads and be adaptable. Uh, commercially useful was certainly an attribute uh, in this design. It had to be feasible for manufacturing to be able to be manufactured in some quantity and at some price that would uh, impact the market. Through that, um, the hardware was basically off the shelf available hardware. And of course, doing what we do, it was an advanced composites airframe. So those were the concept parameters. And as this developed, as the discussion and research evolved, uh, the concept became uh, refined into this two meter by two meter quadcopter, uh, powered by four sets of 24 inch counter rotating props in a ducted fan housing. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this ducted fan concept in, in, in a moment because it's really central to this design. Uh, it's powered by eight high efficiency electric motors uh, using state of the art LiPo batteries. And in the design, you can see that little flying saucer look in the uh, center section. Um, e we uh, e wanted to include internal volume for the controllers, batteries, and some internal payload space in addition to external mounts for a range of payloads that could be employed. Uh, the design rationale behind the heavy lift aerial platform was the use of ducted fan propulsion. When designed right, uh, ducted fans produce about 12% more thrust than open props do. Um, they reduce uh, prop noise uh, by suppressing high speed uh, uh, tip vortices, uh, so they're quieter. Um, this would give this uh, this platform, the ability to park up against a building. It could literally fly to the side of the building and just stay there or in trees or near marine rigging or something to that effect. As part of this concept, it also provides some proximity safety for personnel. Um, these are pretty powerful motors. Uh, an encounter with one of these props could cause some damage. Uh, the ducted fan concept uh, provides some level of protection uh, when working close to this. As the design developed, um, we settled on a, a motor 
um, battery uh, um, uh, uh, runtime um, uh, in intersection of 244 pounds of thrust with a hover reserve payload of 103 pounds. In theory, the machine would lift uh, about uh, about 173 pounds, but the hover reserve is that it could hover in the static state with gusty wind conditions um, and 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 some thermal conditions and that sort of thing. So specified payload would be around 103 pounds. Um, let's take a look at the build uh, on. On this machine, um, started out, of course, with the CAD modeling and then progressed to CNC machining a quarter section plug. Uh, we machine this out of Sika Advanced uh, Resins tooling board, and you can see the process in developing the plug through the, the CNC machining process. Um, we, we settled on doing the quarter section uh, because we thought it would probably be advantageous to us to uh, reduce some of the space requirements. If this thing ever went into production, we would probably do the full half section to avoid having the assembly work. But this is a prototype, it's a first run, and uh, it all worked out in the end. If we were going to do more of these, we would certainly find uh, a number of improvements that we would employ in the process. Um, this is a, a look at the tool fabrication, the, uh, the, the finished plug. The tool fabrication was very straightforward, uh, open molding hand layup. Um, there was no particular need to employ an advanced process in terms of building the tooling. And the tooling turned out to be very successful. It was a very good looking mold um, and um, it worked very, very well uh, working through this, this uh, this process of uh, building the tool. This is the finished quarter section of the tool. Um, we 3D printed uh, substructure fittings. Uh, these printer, these uh, fittings are printed out of ABS. You can see the heft of the, uh, of the fittings themselves. Uh, they are coupled with um, hollow braided carbon fiber tubes, which, uh, which we made on site. Um, and this inner uh, substructure became very, very tough. It was a, an amazingly tough structure for something that was 3D printed. And of course, this holds the landing gear um, and some other um, load carrying uh, uh, structures within the, within the airframe. Uh, the props are 24 inches, uh, 24 by 10 pitch. Uh, the props were made uh, through the vacuum infusion process. The props were made in halves, an A and B half. Uh, they were bonded together. And I don't know if you can see that on the end. It may be underneath your, uh, underneath your tabs, uh, but there's a, a finished balance prop um, and the props turned out to be very, very nice uh, in, the, uh, in the finish process. Um, this is a quick shot of the uh, ventral instrument pod fabrication um, CNC machined. Uh, you, you can see students putting together, uh, working on the patterns, and uh, eventually a tool was, uh, uh, was prescribed out of this and uh, uh, turned into this mock-up uh, ventral uh, instrument pod. This is the initial airframe fit and uh, assembly. Uh, the airframe is... Uh, uh, of uh, carbon fiber laminate, uh, very, very light. The entire airframe, once assembled, um, the specification on the airframe is 29 pounds uh, for the completed airframe um, and turned out to be amazingly strong. It did as we progressed through the process and we realized that this was not going to be a flying version, we did pick up some weight, but on the flying version, the target weight would be at 29 pounds for the uh, completed airframe. Need and to this, start wrapping it up, Bob. Okay, this is a quick look at the trial fit and finishing. Uh, with our finished concept here, uh, applications and market potential, urban air mobility, um, is a big deal. This thing can be scaled up to about a 230 pound payload. We have military, potential military tasking uh, applications, observations and inspections, search and rescue possibilities, um, and cinematography uh, to carry uh, fairly sophisticated gear. Um, real quick, uh, this is the uh, HLAP uh, project team. This is the students that ranged uh, during the course of the project. Uh, we'd like to thank project sponsors, uh, Sika Advanced Resins and Composites One. Um, and uh, 
On behalf of uh, <clears throat> the IRA Student Project team and faculty and administration, thank you very much for this award. It's very much appreciated. Well, thank you very much, Bob, and uh, very well deserved. Uh, and I appreciate uh, all of the background. I got to tell you, I was going to ask you a couple of questions. <laughs> and of course, you uh, had it in those last couple of slides. You know, part of it is scale up and part of it is applications. Mm -hmm. um, one last, uh, one last uh, question. Um, the collaboration that took place between industry and academia, how valuable was that in order to develop this concept? Well, it was certainly valuable. Um, the, uh, uh, we, we went through a learning process um, with the SICA folks on uh, what we could do with the tooling board. That actually flowed into some other projects that we were working on uh, where we were able to make some direct tooling that, that worked out very, very well. And of course, we were able to tap into uh, Composites One's, uh, Composite One's knowledge base Composites One wasn't sponsoring ACE at this point in time, I don't think. So that was just uh, something that was after the fact on this long-term project. Um, but yeah, we had, we had good collaboration with our sponsors uh, and, and it worked out mutually, uh, mutually very well. Well, again, thank you very much, Bob. Uh, we've run out of time for our webinar this afternoon. Um, so I thank you very much and congratulations on winning the prestigious Infinite Possibility Award. Well, so, much. so with that, uh, just a couple of closing comments. First, I want to thank Composites One for sponsoring the CAMEX and ACE Awards. Uh, it's unfortunate that we couldn't all be uh, uh, standing next to each other, congratulating each other, shaking everybody's hand, and everything else that would normally go on. But I hope this webinar gave you a lot more insight to what was going on. I know we went a little bit longer than we had planned, uh, but the presentations were fantastic. The questions were great. And again, on behalf of CAMEX, uh, I wanna thank uh, all of our winners and congratulate all of our winners uh, for the excellent uh, presentations um, and for submitting uh, those products into the uh, ACE and CAMEX awards. I will tell you as, as uh, being a part of the uh, leading up the uh, judges for this uh, panel, I will tell you that the deliberations that went on for all of these products were so encouraging that innovation and thinking about how things become useful to our society um, is, is boundless. And I look forward to next year's awards. So with that, I wanna thank you very much uh, on behalf of uh, staff at SAMPI and ACMA for delivering this webinar. And I wanna make sure that every one of you stay healthy and stay safe. And I wish you a very good day. Look forward to next year's uh, ACE and CAMEX awards in Dallas uh, in October in 2021. Um, let's hope that it is face to face and there's not going to be any problems. So with that, thank you very much for your attention and have a good day. Bye bye.